Are we ready to go? Okay, here we go, you guys. We are so happy to see you. I mean, this is our last event of this incredible year. No, I'm not gonna say the word, um, but this is our Captain Cadre Check and Connect. We're gonna give you some updates and we're gonna have um, an innovation showcase. So here's a few things. Um, we chose to have this as a meeting, which means we want to see all your faces and just stay connected with you. However, we would appreciate it if you'd stay muted. Um, we want you to be present and engaged. So maybe right now, just take a deep breath and just be here and enjoy this next hour as we share things with you and your fellow colleagues share things that will help you prepare for your students to return to in-person learning. Um, we want you to have fun, use the chat, um, enter your questions in the chat because uh, we wanna make sure all our presenters have time to share. And then at the end, we've got it timed that we'll have time to get to your questions. Um, wanted to remind you that May 4th was National Teacher Appreciation Day. I think it's National Teacher Appreciation Week. So I'm sure you all did that. And we wanna thank you, all of you educators who've been helping all of our students, uh, especially our students with autism. And that today is actually National Barrier Awareness Day. Um, and so for the rest of the day, maybe do one thing to help uh, our individuals with disabilities reach their full potential. So we have a few updates. You guys, we're gonna do this. We are really gonna have the Captain Summit in person, November 1st and 2nd at the Riverside Convention Center. We're gonna have some awesome pre-summit workshops. We're gonna have evening outdoor reception. Look, there's gonna be our twinkle lights, you guys. We're gonna go out there. We're having music. There'll be adult beverages for you to purchase. We'll also give you some tokens for your beverages. We're going to have giveaways. We're going to have dancing. There's going to be bocce ball and cornhole and badminton. We're just going to do up Riverside. Let me tell you, we're going to have fun getting together for the first time after too long of an absence from each other. Um, we appreciate all of you and it's so important for us to network and stay together and, um, you know, kind of see each other again in, in Riverside. And if you remember, those of you who are kind of go back a ways with Captain, we did do a summit down in Riverside. It was at the Riverside County Office of Ed. But if you remember, there's that big promenade with all those restaurants and it's a mall and there's outdoor restaurants with twinkle lights. Can you guys tell I like twinkle light outdoor seating in warm weather? It's fun. So, we're gonna do that again and we hope to see you there. You also all should have received an invitation to complete this year's annual Captain Cadre member survey. Um, historically, we have sent the survey out in the fall and asked you to complete it prior to coming to the summit. Um, we changed it um, for a couple of reasons. Um, number one is we want you to just tell us this school year, this academic year, um, what you've been able to do. Um, and then that way we can also summarize those results and share them back to you at the summit in November. So it won't be a year delayed when we're able to show you um, the results of some of, um, some of your efforts. But having said that, we do recognize and completely understand this has been a significantly different year. And that the impacts of COVID, the pandemic, distance learning, um, and the, the roles that you guys have played have probably also been significantly different. Um, so just complete the survey as honestly as you can. Um, we recognize that, you know, some of you may have had challenges completing some of the cadre requirements, but also know that we do have space on this year's survey for you to tell us about all of the amazing things that you have been able to do um, in supporting your teachers and your families um, during this, this huge year of transition. Um, so, um, just wanted to make sure that you guys knew that we appreciate you so much and no matter what the cadre requirements say, we know you guys have been 
busting your behinds working really, really hard and as diligently as you can to, to make sure everything's working well for, um, for your students and, and your family. So um, we will take everything with that recognition um, when we compile this year's data, but we appreciate you uh, completing it. If for some reason you didn't receive it, a couple of steps. First off, check your spam or your junk mail. Oftentimes it gets filtered out of your inbox into one of those places. It will have come from hscaptain at ucdavis.edu. So be looking for an email um, with an invitation from there. If you still can't find the invitation to complete the survey, please email us. Um, I'll put the email in the chat um, that you can send us an email to, or you can send us a chat right now. We are taking record of everything in the chat. So if you can't find it and we need to resend it a different way, let us know and we'll figure out how to get you the survey. So we begin, as you guys remember way back in March, 2020, um, you know, our kids were on distance learning. And so with your help, we created these Padlets. Um, and these were the Padlets, because we love Padlets, uh, that we made for school closure. And we did those in English and in Spanish to support that distance learning. And those are still up there because I know even though a lot of you may have been back to uh, in-person learning for a while, you still have some students with autism who are still doing distance learning. And even if you're moving into in-person and it's now hybrid, you're gonna have a balance. We're leaving those there. Um, and they're curated to have just the right amount of stuff so it's not too much to wade through. Um, we do wanna uh, really thank Tana and Melina and Maribel and Jenica for doing that translation for all of this work. It's been very well received and they worked hard to uh, translate uh, the information into Spanish for us as well as Jenica doing some of the social stories in Chinese. Um, so it takes a team as you guys all know. So now we have new Padlets, of course, because we love Padlets. And these are the new Padlets for transitioning back to in-person schooling to support our educators and our students with autism and our families. And that again is also in English and Spanish for those of you who haven't uh, taken a look at those. And again, they're right on the Captain website. Uh, we worked hard to create a guidance because it's like, what should we be doing to prepare our students and families for this transition? Um, and that's in English and Spanish. So just briefly uh, to go over, this is part of the guidance preparation is, you know, helping our families prepare their children and themselves to get back to in-person schooling. And so the guidance talks about having parents talk about that return to in-person school, maybe having them drive or walk by the school to take photos of the classroom. And maybe you could do that and send it to them as well making a storybook about the classroom or a video of the school and the classroom, you know, having our students with autism while they're home looking at that going, oh, because guess what? It's going to be different. So we're going to need those social narratives about all those new normal things, which is the health and safety precautions, you know, the mask, the social distancing, the, you know, the hand washing and the hygiene and all of that. This is on the Padlet, it's called A Story. Now it's not a social story, it's a story. And it's about my new teacher and it's in English and Spanish. And you guys just put in your own photos of your teacher and fill in the blank. This is my teacher, her name is da da da. And it's in English and Spanish. And then here's for the speech and language specialist. And then you could go on and on because we know there's gonna be you know, a paraeducator and an OT and a PT and an APE and everybody. So you could get them prepared. These are my new people because we do know they may not be going back to the same classroom where they were before, maybe all new and different. So this is a, pa a template on there for you. And, and one other thing with that particular template that some teachers have um, been doing that has been really helpful is a picture of the teacher or the therapist with the mask on and a picture of them with the mask off. So that you're showing a picture of what they'll look like in person when they see them with the mask on, but they also may recognize them from distance learning with the mask off. So little adaptation you can make to make it relevant for COVID. Good. Um, again, preparing, uh, having parents prepare their children, you know, with the health guidelines, like, you know, practicing the social distancing and following arrows and all of that that can go on at the home. And this is an important one is really 
uh, encouraging parents, and this is for the parents to read about, to get ready to make that bedtime and morning routine something practice, not the night before they go back to in-person schooling, because we're just imagining that what time they've been going to bed and getting up in the morning has been really different than on a day when they're going to get out and up on a bus and back to your school. So we want to get those sleep patterns established way before the night before school of in-person schooling happens. Um, and to practice calming strategies, so making sure the parents know how to do that. Um, we know our students with autism, it's, it's not going to be easy for some of them with this transition. And so they're going to need some ways to self-calm and uh, kind of adjust, as well as uh, working on some practicing these help-seeking scripts. Uh, you know, they're going to tend to take the easiest path, which is behaviorist communication to communicate that something's not going well. And so again, working with the families and encouraging them to have ways to ask for help and assistance when the going gets tough. Um, we've heard a lot that uh, our students with autism are really finding it a challenge, some of them to comply with the mask wearing. Um, and so we've offered some guidance. This is the particular guidance for parents about mask wearing for children. Um, and then these are some behavioral supports, you know, a punch card, good job, you've been wearing your mask, uh, or you're working for a break from wearing a mask. So do this, this, and this, and then you get to take the mask off for 10 seconds and go out for a walk. And again, we have these self-calming resources on these Padlets to help you. And remember to use those that are evidence-based. Um, so that means like the incredible five-point scale, the one that we have for the social anxiety reduction. And this is another one, but, you know, making sure that there's a way. And I think probably all the kids are going to need a way to self-soothe, as we know, these these evidence-based practices that we have for our students with autism can be super beneficial to all students with disabilities and without disabilities as they return to this new experience they get to have. And this is yours, Patty. So the section on preparing yourself, we've put together um, in the guidance document, these recommendations to help families um, get prepared for the transition. Um, and also the accompanying resources. Um, so gathering information about the school schedule, transportation, and the health and safety guidelines and policies, really important. And, um, you know, I've been hunting on different websites and sometimes going on the school's website, they're not very easy to find. Um, and so, and, and no two schools have the exact same health and safety guidelines. So it's not like there's a universal place that families can go. So. Um, helping them to be able to, to gather all of that information. We have a really nice resource called the New School Checklist on the Padlet um, that can help families to organize that information. Um, we're also um, really encouraging families to um, have early and frequent communication with their child's educational team um, and update the goals and update the services and supports um, you know, as, as needed after a period of readjustment. Um, and there's a resource on the Padlet um, that um, was actually designed for any school transition, but since this is kind of a big one, um, we have a student snapshot um, and there are multiple examples on the Padlet for how to do it, but it's a way of being able to summarize the most important things about a student that a new teacher or new team would need to know. And, you know, families after homeschooling and, and doing distance learning for a year, probably gonna have some new ideas and strategies and things that they wanna communicate to the teachers that could be really helpful. Um, so having a, a way to be able to do that um, using that student snapshot, um, it's a great resource, so check it out. Um, and then, um, you know, I don't know if you guys are feeling the pressure, but I know certainly in any conversation I'm having with families, there's a lot of anxiety around learning loss and wanting to jump back in and start making up for some of that lost time and perhaps um, making up for some of those um, potentially lost skills. Um, but we're really encouraging and, and, and trying to help teachers and parents understand that there is going to be this time of transition and acclimating and readjusting um, and that, you know, addressing any of the potential learning loss that may happen will come. But right now it's really all about social emotional well being and reintegrating into the routines and and getting back into the social groove of being with people again. And I, I think that's true for all of us. Go ahead, Ann. 
So this is the, um, the new school information um, checklist that um, is a template on the Padlet. Next slide. Um, collaborating is another key message, and we have tons of resources around this. Um, and, um, you know, one of the best ways that we feel like we can encourage teachers and parents to collaborate is around developing and um, using a lot of those visual supports and social narratives. Um, you know, th those are some of the social stories can be read at school to prepare the child for, um, you know, what's happening in the school, but they could also be read at home. Um, and so um, really working and collaborating on visual supports that can be used to reinforce a lot of the health and safety procedures um, in both settings. Next slide. Um, this is the student snapshot I was telling you about earlier. It's just a, a two page, one page front and back um, template that can be used to highlight some of the most important things that parents may want the school team to know about their child. Next slide. And then, of course, probably one of your biggest jobs um, if you're in the educational setting is to help teachers prepare the classroom. Um, and, you know, there's the, the big three EVPs that we know that when any new school situation occurs, we really want to have proactively in place. And those are those antecedent based interventions, visual supports and reinforcement. Um, so really supporting teachers and making sure that they have the structure, the routines, the visual supports. Um, and all of those prevention tactics in place before the kids come back to school, uh, but that they continue to work on those and get those, those new routines ingrained um, and, and use lots of positive reinforcement these first few weeks back so that the, the new habits are established. Next slide. Um, and one of the ways that, um, that teachers can help students, um, and this is actually came out of some work that we have done at the UC Davis Mind Institute, um, is taking little pictures, making little buttons of um, who the person is behind the mask. Kind of the same idea of that storybook of having a picture with the mask and without. Um, this can be a way of being able to help sort of bridge that for kids. And it's a fun activity that you could do even with the whole class to have a picture um, that, that shows the person without their mask. Visual supports, those, those new rules, those new safety protocols. Um, we've got on the Padlet some um, printable resources for that. Um, but one of the things that have been really handy, and this is for all teachers and for all learners, is having them in a portable keychain so that anytime that you're anywhere on campus and a student needs a prompt about um, following those safety rules, flipping out your little keychain rules and showing the student what the, what the protocol is that they're needing to follow, um, that's been really helpful and can be a nice way of universally spreading these visual supports on campus um, because, you know, all kids are gonna need reminders um, at times of how to follow these rules. So we have a resource on the Padlet um, that you can print and, and use for that as well. So I'm gonna stop share and Jamie Holmes is our first presenter. She's gonna bring up her slides and Patty's going to introduce her. So um, we send out an all call to all of you cadre to um, share with one another um, your innovations and your ideas, what's been working on this return to in-person learning. Um, and um, Jamie Holmes um, is um, one of our cadre members who volunteered to share some of the resources that she's been using. A little bit about Jamie before I hand it over to her. Um, I've known her now for several years and um, I think it's really cool and you guys will really appreciate this. Jamie actually is a, is a classroom teacher and was a classroom teacher who participated in one of our captain training series um, up in the Northern California area. And I could tell like immediately by how excited she got about the evidence-based practice that she was gonna be part of that 5%. You know, the 5% that could actually come to a training and walk away with 10,000 things that they actually take back and do without even needing a substantial amount of coaching. Um, and it turns out I was right. She was part of that 5%. Um, she contacted me a couple of years ago wanting to know how she could get more 
Um, she just was consuming these evidence-based practices in her work as a teacher and, and just wanted to continue to learn more and do more. Um, so this last year, Jamie became one of our LEND trainees at the UC Davis Mind Institute, and that's our leadership in neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, and as part of that LEND training, she got to become a Captain Cadre. Um, and so has been doing a lot of work um, with Captain on resource development, on helping us look at some of the statewide data on autism and, um, and some of um, the disparities and that sort of thing. And you guys will learn more about that at the summit. We plan on sharing some of um, her uh, findings with you then. But um, she's going to present to you and share with you today some of the innovations and things that she developed um, for her classroom, um, particularly with a focus on helping families. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Jamie to show you some of these amazing resources and ideas. Thanks, Patty. Um, so hopefully everybody can can hear me okay. Um, um, so yes, thank you. Um, I'm so excited to be here. Yay, I'm a cadre member. <laughs> That's awesome. And so now I get to see all these faces and I can't wait to um, actually connect with you guys in person at some point. And um, this is just such an honor and a thrill to, to be here with you guys um, today. So, um, um, yes, so like Patty said, I was asked to come um, and talk a little bit today about um, some things that some strategies that I found to be effective in helping students transition transition back to school or in person learning. Um, so as a special educator, of course, I've had the opportunity to collaborate with many families, um, students, of course, teachers, but also those service providers, school personnel, um, bus drivers <laughs> um, about this topic. So uh, Patty already shared a little bit about me. So I've been in the field for a very, very long time. Um, I was also a regular ed teacher before I became a special educator. Um, and yes, um, Patty and, and um, it was Candace Lighthall who did the training um, basically changed my, my life and my world when I went through, I had to do like this added authorization for my credential. And so they, oh, you know, go to this captain and I'm, you know, captain, what's that? And, you know, and it just, you know, like, like Patty said, it was life changing. It was just the, the best thing I've ever been through. And so since then I've continued my work and now I'm in the LEND program um, and just loving that. I'm also a coach for the Family Navigator program um, through SED and I'm finishing up my master's now. So lots going on. Um, I wasn't sure if they were gonna show you the, the Padlet uh, this morning. So you already know, I think where that is. It's, it's on the, the Captain website. Um, like I said, I wasn't sure if they were gonna show that. So I had put it in here just in case. But what I will say in reference to this, you guys, is that this has been huge for my families. So in fact, um, just this morning, I had a, another parent call me in tears. And, um, and so it's just, it, it's a great way to kind of take, it just, it, it's somebody else in our corner as, as whatever service providers, educators, whatever support, you know, providers we are for our families to just say that, hey, here's a, a lots of resources. It's not just one, there's, social stories and visual supports and, and videos and, and you name it. It's, it's just so wonderful. I can't say enough about it. And um, like I said, as somebody that's in the classroom daily with these families to be able to share this is, is just an amazing thing. Um, so I know we don't have a lot of time, so excuse me if I go through these fairly quickly, um, but there are some strategies just to highlight today. Um, and so, of course, the visual supports, um, social stories have been huge in helping ease our, our kiddos back to school, reviewing that morning routines, routine several times daily, wearing masks um, as a family at home, practice using your eyes to communicate using timers, that's a huge one, you guys, using timers to increase the tolerance, first then boards, not just the boards, but the language, first this, then this, and keeping that, you know, uh, vocabulary very short and succinct. Um, and then using our bus drivers, you guys, it's just wonderful to 
they're they're coming with oh the students taking their mask off and oh this is happening and you know so so looping them in they're they're a wonderful resource and to loop them in and give them copies of our visual supports and you know make that that's that whole circle of family driver school you know special ed regular ed and, and the whole circle all of us working together using that same language and the same tools is making this really a profound um, uh, strategy for the students. Um, and like I said, using those um, communicating, making that full circle so that the, the family and the bus driver, everybody's in the loop. So when the student does arrive to campus and they've done, they've followed that routine, that they are reinforced at school. That's, that's really, really important. Um, and hopefully either um, Patty or Anne, you're monitoring the chat because I'm, I don't want to, I, I don't trust myself multitasking too much. We're monitoring your chat okay. and, you have, and you have five more minutes. Okay, thank you. Okay, I didn't, I, I can't multitask that well. Um, so real quick, using, using your eyes. So what I started doing is, you know, we all have, uh, are familiar with the faces, the happy face, the sad face, the angry face, right? So you know, how do we do that now with, you know, show me your face or what face are you, or this is my face. I started using eyes and like playing the eye game. And so luckily I'm older, so I have some wrinkles now. So I'll look at my happy eyes, see all these wrinkles that those are my, my smiling eyes. And you can kind of just play with this again. It's kind of just that normalizing where we are right now. So I started playing with the eye game and it's actually had great success. So it sounds kind of silly, but you can kind of toy around with that idea, just using using your eyes as, as a communicator. Same thing with normalizing is wearing masks, right? So play the mask game, you know, use timers. Oh, I kept my own for two minutes. How long did you keep yours on? Three minutes. Awesome. You know, again, just normalizing. So using some of those things to normalize where we are right now. Um, of course, visual supports, right? Yay! I'm the visual support queen. That's what my staff um, laughingly calls me. So uh, Patty's already showed you some of the, the ways that I've tailored these um, visual supports to meet our world now. So social distancing. Actually, hand sanitizer is one of the big struggles we have in the classroom. They don't like, the students with autism don't like um, how it feels on their hands. They don't like the scent. So that's actually been a, a big one for us. Following their, those arrows can be a little overwhelming sometime, everybody walking in the same direction. So I've, I've tailored those uh, visual supports to, um, to uh, mirror what, what we're doing now. And again, that morning routine of just practicing that as many times as humanly possible <laughs> to remember that backpack, mask, keep it on while you go and that last square is populated then with what they will receive when they um, arrive at school. Um, so I wanted to show you real quick and I also want to remember remind you that um, all of these um, templates and the videos with the how to's for families and even for for any of you watching today um, are available on the Padlet so nobody has to reinvent the wheel just go to the Padlet um, print easy takes like three to five minutes to make them so they're all there and the videos again of of well I have it now what do I do <laughs> they're all there as well so this is my one-stop shop so like Patty was saying I Patty I forgot to bring my keychain yes keychains are huge and if you don't have a keychain or in addition a one-stop shop so we all know first then boards token boards choice boards etc right so for families that want just a grab and go, this is my grab and go. So this is what it looks like real quick. So it's got on the top things that you might want them to do. So um, get on the bus, um, use the restroom, get on, you know, um, get complete some work, all the items and you can populate these. I tailor these for my families, but also just things that you know are reinforcing. So um, we have the first you know, okay, so what do you want to earn? Great, you want to earn some video games. Okay, we're going to need to put our mask on first, and then we're going to earn the video games. Also, for um, a choice board, so if we're finding our student is um, starting to show maybe those escalation, those precursor behaviors, and we're starting to see, okay, they're getting a little excited. Um, 
Okay, so I know that um, you want to earn some time on the swing today. You've already um, showed me that on your other board or you've told me or whatever that might be. Um, so we could use this as just your basic choice board. Okay, great. So to get on the swing, we're gonna um, you know, do our breaths. We're gonna take five deep breaths and then we're gonna have time on the swing. So first breaths and swing, right? And then, like I said, also just as a token board. So, okay, great. We're gonna um, be doing our work this morning. So you can either put a few check mark, a little uh, check mark right here as you go. So again, this is my one-stop shop, okay? Um, that's, that's that. It just has everything right there where you need it. And again, it's that first then language, which is so important for our students. Um, so how are we doing on time? Do I have time to show you? have one more minute. Okay. Well, I don't think I have time. So uh, I was going to show a sample video, but they are on the Padlet. Um, and so again, this, this is my morning routine video. So it shows that first backpack, then mask, ride the bus, and arrive to school for that highly reinforcing, remember highly reinforcing activity for when they arrive at school. So again, they take three to five minutes to make, give one to the bus driver, you know, families, teachers, we all have one. So then we're all on the same page, the student arrives. And again, it's that circle of support that we're creating for our families and students that everyone's using the same language and we can all just, um, provide these kiddos with the support. This has really been, I'm in the classroom as they've come back and I can tell you it's it's been quite a struggle. So um, these things are working. So I've been excited. Thank you so much for letting me share today. Amy, why don't you go ahead and show your video and everybody oh. is on the Padlet Families. and we'll I wanted let to you in okay. with that. About, oh, sure. Um, okay. Our students transitioning so, back to you guys hear? learning. And obviously, that's going to present many challenges in the morning, um, getting your student ready for school and back in that kind of normal routine. So we've developed some visual supports that are really excellent for this purpose. Um, here's one that I've made that just basically goes through the morning routine of backpack on, put your face mask on, ride the bus, and then in the last square, you can choose a preferred activity for that we know is reinforcing for your student for when they arrive to school. So you can go through this in the morning. Oops. Sorry, looks like. Oh, that's okay. They got a sense of it. Okay. It is on yeah, the tablet. I think it's lagging. I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> it's a great video, you guys. And it's, uh, there's, she's actually got two on the Padlet for you to share with your families and educators. So Joan, do you wanna share your slides? And we'll do a quick introduction. Joan Ralph is a regional implementation lead as part of our Captain SOPA content lead grant for autism. She's also a lead. Joan, do you have your slides up? Go on there. Okay, um, she's a lead behavior specialist for Alameda Unified School District and part of the Captain 007, I mean, Captain of the East Bay, sorry. And so she's gonna present to you uh, some of the work that she's created to prepare her students for back to in-person schooling. Take it away, Joan. Thank you, and Jamie, thank you for sharing. Those were all, the visuals and everything were wonderful and amazing. I'm excited to go explore the Padlet, so thank you. Um, so welcome everybody, I'm excited to be here. It's great to see everybody. I'm gonna be talking about two things today. The first is um, a PowerPoint on shaping mask wearing. Um, this was developed out of the need to help our preschool students who are returning to in-person instruction. Um, some of the parents were sharing with our team that they were not wearing a mask yet. And we knew that was going to be something that they were gonna be focusing on um, when returning to in-person instruction. So we were doing a monthly um, training for our preschool parents, and this was just one of the topics, was teaching your child to wear a mask. I'm just going to go through it quickly, um, and this is on the Padlet for you to kind of look through it more and take a deeper dive and look through it. Um, so we just started off by just kind of reminding parents that we didn't want the first experience to be negative, right? So you didn't want to just like force the mask on them and or do it when you're running out the door. 
we wanted to remind them that you wanted to be really have it to be a positive experience. And we wanted to remind them that for some students, it may take one day. For others, it may take a week or a month. So to really kind of focus on, let's keep this positive, but let's encourage them to be wearing this mask. Um, these were just some tips. A lot of them, um, Jamie already covered in hers, so they're just very similar. <laughs> um, and these were just kind of steps that we kind of took it and we kind of broke down the steps. So kind of created that task analysis of how they could wear and model for the, help their child wear the mask. So like the first one is like the parents model wearing the mask. You have your child maybe pick, pick out a mask that they wanna wear, put the mask on the table in front of the child so they could just see it touch it, celebrate the mask, talk about the mask, um, have the child put the mask on maybe a favorite toy that they had. And then maybe at the first step is a child kind of just brings the mask six feet, six inches away from their face. And then you celebrate that. Yay, you got it six inches. Um, and then maybe they bring it three inches. Yay, it's three inches from your face. And maybe they just hold it over their face like this for maybe tell the count of three, one, two, three, and then it's off. And then maybe you, I'm thinking if I have a mask here. Oh, I do. And then maybe you take it and they do, they put the mask and they just drape it around one ear and then you celebrate that. And then maybe they drape it around the other ear, celebrate that and then slowly it's up. So taking all those steps and then slowly celebrating each of the steps and then maybe they leave the mask on for 30 seconds and then it's up to a minute. So just really celebrating those small steps. So it's all laid out here. Um, and then there's that first thin board. Uh, and then once again, just kind of that token board. So that was what we talked about for the parents um, about the mask. The next one I'm going to talk to you is a, a social story that I wrote. Now, the cool thing about this social story is that I was um, one of the lucky ones who was able to attend um, Carol Gray's Social Stories 10.3. Um, and she actually reviewed this. So it has Carol Gray's stamp of approval of meeting the 10.3 guidelines. Um, so this is a social story we wrote about um, returning to school and the safety procedures. I left this blank because on the ones that we did for our sites is that I, we just took a picture of the school and we inserted it here. And then before the students returned to school, the case managers sent the so social stories out to the families to help review them. So this is a story about safety procedures at my school. My community has COVID-19 safety procedures and rules. One rule is that everyone in school wears a mask. The mask helps it keeps me and other people safe. In my community, in some stores, there are arrows on the floor to help people move safely. At my school, there'll be yellow arrows on the ground to help me move safely. This was really important because one thing that Carol Gray mentioned is that generalization piece for those social stories. And this really helps them generalize that information. Um, the students are familiar and they probably have seen the arrows that are in Starbucks or the arrows that are in TJ Maxx, kind of like telling the flow of traffic. So to take something that they've already seen and just to help them generalize it, oh yeah, they're gonna be at school too. So that's the whole point of that is to help them with the generalization of the skills. Um, in stores and other businesses in my community, sometimes there are social distancing markers on the floor. The markers show people where to stand. And at my school, there'll be red social distancing markers on the ground telling me where to stand too. So same idea. We've all seen these at Starbucks and other stores, um, and they were going to be in our, at our schools as well. When I return to school, there will be uh, rules about following the arrows on the floor, wearing a mask and standing on the dots. The rules are very important safety procedures to keep me and my classmates and teachers safe. Oh, I think that's it. I was fast. So those were the two things that I wanted to, uh, to share with you guys. Thank you, Joan. And now we have Cassandra Guerrero and she's gonna pull up her slides and I'll do a brief intro. We're, we're right on schedule. Got two more presentations at 10 minutes each. 
So Cassandra is a speech language pathologist and also a program specialist down at San Benito High School. And she's also a trained uh, Circle of Friends a Club advisor and trainer. Um, she's really into inclusive education and is making it work down at that high school. So Cassandra, take it away and way to represent Captain 007. Sorry, my, I have three monitors and my mouse was lost for a second. Hi, everybody. Um, so those of you that know me and as Anne said, um, know that I'm really passionate about um, inclusion and um, inclusive education. So um, I've been running a Circle of Friends program at my campus for 11 years now. And I once COVID happened, um, I felt like we need to be able to make this work virtually to still stay connected. Um, and then as we're transitioning back to hybrid, instruction, what's really happened is that because we've really kind of kept these things in place during um, distance learning, we also are able to kind of bridge back into hybrid and have students feel connected to their school community and to their peers um, and kind of help that transition happen and help them feel a little bit more motivated and also help the environment to be really inclusive for them. Um, so the two EBPs I'm gonna be talking about, the main one is peer-based instruction and intervention. And I just have like a little blur and Cassandra, here. you have like a, a black square on your slide. So I don't know if you have a chat box there. Now there's one at the bottom. Now you I have think, squares. There, they're all gone. Thank you. When I optimize it for video, it makes the black squares happen sometimes. Okay, they're so. gone now. Thank you. Okay. All right, so um, so these are just the, um, the uh, definitions from the captain materials of what um, what it is. And so what I found is that virtually including peer teachers in the classroom and with circle of friends um, helped create relationships and a stable routine that supported students um, social connection as they transition from remote to hybrid learning. Um, and then exercise I'm going to talk about just a little bit because I we also have a special Olympics component that we um, that we use and that's been really um, been really a nice addition that we've added in the last couple of years. Um, and we're doing a big event in a couple of weeks with that as well. So just for a little context, um, our kind of setup from the beginning of the year was that in August and September, we were fully remote, um, no students on campus. Then in October, we opened several cohorts um, and we had two in-person teachers for our most intensive learners that had the most intensive needs. Um, and then one learning hub with uh, para support. So the students that were a little more independent and could come on and they just log on with their teacher, but there was paras in there helping them with that if they were having trouble at home. And then just a couple weeks ago on April 19th, we opened fully in hybrid. And so we have um, almost all of our SD program back on campus and some peers back in person. And so kind of gonna talk about what that looked like in terms of transitioning that with the peer support and how that supported our transition to hybrid learning. So um, there's two different components and with PBII, there's a more structured way to do it. And there's also a more naturalistic way to do it um, as it kind of like goes through if you, if you watch the module. And so during distance learning in our peer teaching class, um, the peers would zoom in and lead lessons. So if the whole class was on Zoom, you know, that was one thing, um, but, um, when they were in cohorts, um, we would have some of our students with more intensive needs on campus and with the teacher, and then they would still zoom in the peers because the peers couldn't come onto campus and they would project them onto the whiteboard and then students would be um, connecting. We had a student that would run up to the whiteboard and try to hug her peer on the board and was really excited every time that the peers um, would come in and they would lead sensory routine or um, different things that the class would do. Um, but it had just helped build relationships and supported student engagement. Um, and some of the peers created some videos and cards to connect with students as well. Um, and so, and then once hybrid started, some of the peers were able to come back in person, which was nice. And so um, they already had that connection with our students. And, and of course, we all know that our students are more motivated by their friends than they are by us, right? So if their friend tells them like, to wear their mask, maybe they'll listen better than if their teacher or their parent tells them because they want to impress their friend more. Um, so I just included a really quick example of one of the videos that a peer had created as part of her class assignment for the peer teaching class. Um, and this also uses video modeling. 
Hi guys, it's me Katie and we're going to do chores around the house. First up is folding clothes. So we're going to fold a hot dog style and then hamburger style. Boop, boop, boop. We're going to fold it hot dog style again, then hamburger style, and then another hamburger fold. And we're going to put it back and give it a little pat. Next up we will be organizing shoes. Here's me putting shoes away. And boop, boop. Next is putting away dirty laundry. Take a shirt and put it in like that and that and that and if you want you can throw it in to make it a fun game and i just want to say that i miss you all so much so that was just a really sweet example of um, a class assignment that somebody did but also it helped create connection and relationships with the students in the class um, and so for circle of friends um, we when we transition back to hybrid we still are not able to have our club meetings together because the students are still um, even though they're not in cohorts anymore, they're still, they come to class or to campus for just their class and then they have to leave. Um, our students in our SD program are here from a little bit longer of the day, but, but the peers um, can't really come and stay. We don't really have a lunch time. And so we had to continue with some of our um, virtual options for that. And so we have kept it on a consistent day and time all year. So students already have an established routine and connections with their peers. We have students log in all the time who are like, where's Mia? Where's, you know, where's so-and-so, the friends that they recognize and that they um, like hanging out with. So um, we, how we structure it is we do Tuesday, uh, for us it's Tuesdays and we do hangouts at lunch on Zoom um, and we rotate activities. So we do large group activities where we have a craft or a Zoom game um, have, we have unified sports seasons that last five, week and, five weeks, and um, two of the weeks we'll do a live workout with, an, with a student leading the workout, and everybody else can just participate along on Zoom. And then we also have inclusion events where we have partnered with different sports and other activities on campus where, so we partnered with our cheer team and they came on one week and taught everybody a cheer. We, par we partnered with our FFA group and they did a whole PowerPoint about different animals and this, everybody could ask questions about those. Um, and then our student officers make and uh, post flyers and lead those activities. Um, and so these are just a couple examples of some of those things that you could do as kind of like a less structured hangout on Zoom versus like a lesson. So we have virtual dance parties. We had a Halloween bingo and I have linked it um, to, the, um, to the actual website that we just found where you can um, just create bingo cards and play online. We did a Halloween costume parade where we just spotlighted people one at a time. They got to share about what their costume was. There's just different this or that games that you can find on Teacher Pay Teachers. Bring your pet or stuffed animal. That was when everyone was at home. Simon says, making a Valentine's card. And whenever we did a craft, we did something really simple that like all you need is a piece of paper and a pen or whatever you wanted to use to decorate it. And with that also we did digitally um, for the Valentine's cards. And then the unified workouts and um, the inclusion events that I talked about. And these are just some examples of what some of those looked like. Like I said, a lot of them were from teachers, pay teachers, um, and they're really easy to do for like lots of different ages, actually. Um, I have high schoolers, but a lot of them are, um, you know, developmentally not able to do more complex things that you might need to access on a computer. So we just, we would pr project it and then we would give the directions of what to do. Um, and it was pretty simple. Um, one thing that I really wanted to highlight is I have a student with autism who, when he was on campus, really had a difficult time with behaviors and connecting with peers and, and um, over distance learning. He's just really made so much progress. Um, and he actually came to me with this idea that he wanted to do a kindness challenge because he said everyone's um, so isolated on Valentine's Day and they can't see their friends or go on dates. And so he actually collaborated with our officer board. He took other people's suggestions. He connected with the school um, and they created this kindness challenge where people got to sign up. We would send them a digital card that they could customize and send to a friend. And then we did a little drawing with prizes for everybody that participated. And he has transitioned back into hybrid like beautifully. I could never have imagined last year him being on campus so peacefully. Um, and then we also have ability awareness presentations that we uh, presented in all our biology classes that we converted into a digital format that we presented via Zoom. Um, I have a little video here that I don't think I have time for, um, but it's just an example of like one of the pieces of the presentation where she's talking about bullying 
and that um, students with special needs are often bullied at a larger percentage than students without. And so it's just sensitizing, I'm gonna just skip it, um, is sensitizing the campus to have a more positive and inclusive environment. And what this does is that when students are having a hard time transitioning or some behaviors are happening or things are happening that are a little like more out in the public area that students really don't pay any mind to it and they let that student go on about their day and they don't bully or bring attention to it. Um, and this is just another slide from that presentation. And then um, we also did a virtual inclusion week uh, where we had spirit days every day and we had a virtual prom. Oh, that's my timer that my 10 minutes is up. So I'm just gonna go really fast to this last little part. Um, we had a virtual prom on Friday and we just did that on Zoom as well. Um, and here's our little uh, prom flyer. We encourage people to dress up. It's just about an hour. We spotlight people's dance moves. It's a lot of fun. And then um, this is just some information about the unified sports stuff that we do. Um, Special Olympics Northern California has a guidebook with a weekly uh, with five week seasons where they have video links to all of the workouts and it's really easy. We just post it on our Google Classroom. And like I said, we do some of the workouts live on Zoom during Circle of Friends time. Um, and I think this is the last thing, yeah. So we're, we're gonna do a really big event in our community this year. We had what we call gifted games for about 14 or 15 years. It was a countywide kind of special Olympics type event. And so this year what we're doing is we're creating basically uh, a resource for everyone to, to do a workout challenge every day from the Sonk guidebook. And then on Friday of that week, we're gonna have a big webinar where everybody from all over our county can log in and do a workout with our officers and present digital awards. So. That was pretty much. Thank you, Cassandra. Um, Thank you. We really appreciate you sharing all that and all the uh, things that you're doing. So now we're going to hear from Kevin Douglas from up in Calusa. We're right on time. You've got nine minutes. Um, so uh, Patty, you're going to introduce Kevin. So Kevin's a BCBA with the Calusa County Office of Education. And I think he's going to provide some amazing examples of how putting those evidence-based practices in place in a classroom can really help to support all of the safety protocols and mandates from COVID. Take it away, Kevin. All right, thanks for letting me be here. I'm really excited to share the information. Uh, it's a good success story. It, it blew away our expectations. We didn't think we'd be that successful with all the challenges. And what made it even more amazing was this was in a classroom with a first year teacher who was dealing with all of this stuff at the same time. So it was really cool and we're really glad to highlight it. I wanted to have her here, but she's got kids, so she's real, doing real work instead of me. So my other partner could not be here, Jessica Galloway. She's new to us from Ventura County, which has been amazing this year to have some extra supports. Uh, so she's going to be around for a while too, so really excited to hopefully share some more stuff going into next year. So uh, just a quick little piece, Birchfield Elementary School in the Calusa County Unified School District, real tiny little school, I think 431 students there. The class when we looked at was Samantha Atkinson's. She's our TK through third, and it's our extensive support program. Basically, her classroom, 16 students, pretty diversified, mostly students on the autism spectrum, but it's mostly a language-based program. Comprehensive gen ed campus, and Calusa County is different. We don't have individual special ed in the district, so the county provides all special education support and staff. Uh, we also are pretty rural, so we didn't have like interactive whiteboards or extra iPads, so all the instruction was pretty much hands-on with the students. Our summary was August distance learning, like everyone else, really struggling through. Uh, one thing that really helped us out, um, our county office put in extra internet, uh, I forget, like hubs on the existing cell phone towers, so our rural students could actually get internet. That was something that was not possible for a lot of our families. October, we started our small cohorts. So those individuals with extensive needs were coming in for one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, November, we got our elementary waivers. So we were AB cohorts. And then uh, after spring break at that campus, because they were all different, every district followed something differently. We opened full days, five days a week, full time. So we were back, all the kids on campus at the same time. So very anxiety inducing, but it was awesome. So. In October, we knew, hey, we got a cohort coming. We're planning on opening. We're again, really rural. So it was easier for us to get our numbers under control. 
So we started the social narratives for return, really practicing visual supports on those symptoms checklists, some calming kits. Um, I think we talk about it more, but knowing we had to make sure every single kid had their own materials. We couldn't be sharing things like in the past on small things. And then really introducing the visual schedules. So even though it was, you know, on video and different ways we could get the information to the families, really front loading this information with the kids. When we went to our AB, again, in the morning, it was a little more intensive needs. They would go home around 1130, sanitize everything else, bring in our more kind of resource type program for the afternoon. And it worked really, really well. So going back to those visual schedules with the workstations, every kid had their own stuff. So going from their visual schedule to get their supplies, to get their individualized buckets, we tried to make sure everything was independent as possible to limit contact, um, and the kids picked up on it really well. So everything else was color coordinated, which really helped us out. And we started color coordinating in all that distance learning. So everything ELA was purple, purple bins, purple this, purple that, blue was math. Red is our unique curriculum, which some of you are probably familiar with. And then yellow was our whole group, which was spaced out, but we were set up to have six kids in the classroom at a time with all their different plexiglass things, um, putting different areas out on the carpet, because yellow basin meant like, these are our physical borders of where we wanna be. So here's a picture of the purple station. Like I said, purple, 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 really helped the kids out. Um, even the divider had purple edges around the side. We set it up so initially one-on-one, -on -one, but so we could hopefully get three kids and a staff back in there. We didn't really want to put it right by that nice window where the kids would be distracted the whole time, but we knew the ventilation piece and everything else. So it was nice. We were able to work on it and the kids responded. They were really great. So the other thing we wanted to do was really limit that physical contact, which we knew was going to be impossible, but focusing very much on that least to most prompt hierarchy. So again, really looking at that maintaining safe distance and all of our students, even some of our more, you know, students that need a lot of extra prompts, we are pretty much away from any type of physical prompt with them, unless it's like a real guiding lesson. So all those transitions that were challenging standing in line, it was amazing on how far we got them through on that prompt hierarchy. And as always with prompt hierarchy, it's more reminding staff what to be doing with those prompts. Um, that was fascinating. So our success story, again, we are back to five days a week. Um, one student remained on distance learning, unfortunately. Minimum of 20% inclusion for all students. And that was a big challenge on a lot of sites, just different cadre rules on, can you have paras moving in and out of classrooms? What are we gonna do about this, this or that? having all these things in place alleviated so much other staff anxiety in the classrooms. And then again, most of our students, you know, got more than 80% inclusion when we opened full time, which we were ecstatic about. Um, let's see, increasing. And yeah, the last one, no COVID-19 cases, no exposures. We did not close down for a single day. Now there were a couple classrooms on that school site that had to take breaks, but we are able to keep through and keep everyone healthy and safe the entire school year, which was a huge accomplishment. Uh, let's see, so sorry, my slides are in my way or the pictures are. So again, going back to that visual schedule that was linked to the workstations really, really helped us out. Birchfield Primary, we, that was our biggest success story. We had successes everywhere else, but this one, again, it blew us out of the water. Um, and again, kind of having to pull those kids back in the beginning and not have as much inclusion, but really working on teaching those things correctly without causing stress, basically really helped us out again on not having to have those unintentional segregations due to behavior challenges and things along those lines. And Again, having that structure in place alleviated so much staff anxiety and parent anxiety too. So just a couple of pictures we had, basically our COVID rules, we went over all the time. These were introduced right away. We had them posted everywhere we needed to to do those reminders, just part of the system. Also worked on some basic socially distanced greetings. Hey, you can weep, you can do your thumbs up, peace signs, just all the different ways we can make sure to doing interaction without having to break that kind of bubble. Some just basic visual schedules we used. We color coded all uh, oral sensory things too. So any chewy block or anything else, every kid had their own color to really, I mean, 
I don't know if the kids would pay attention too much, but it really helped the staff on it. And not every kid needed the same schedule. So really individualizing them. The one on the left is a kid that spends more time in there. The one on the right is a kid who just pops in for one station and then turns back to general ed. Some other ways for brain breaks that did some other ways to saying hi. So just as many different creative ways as we could. These are on the key rings. So these were out with us on the playground, things along those lines. Uh, and then again, using more of those brain breaks, just calming activities, really front loading all the different things we can do to get energy out of little kids when you can't touch the playgrounds or things like that. So that was my quick one. I tried to go as fast as I could to make sure we were able to get some questions in the end, but yes, I couldn't be more proud of my staff, my families, my students. Again, when this started, we were just saying, you know, how are we going to make sure to keep going when we have to close down, but we didn't. And again, just Samantha, she's an amazing woman. Just the fact first year teaching just blew us out of the water. Um, I almost didn't show a picture of her or name. If anyone emails her about a job, I will find you and hunt you down. Um, but anyways, uh, we'll get her to presenting captain next year. I know everyone's trying to still stop. But it was awesome. And again, just after this, yeah, just something that really filled our hearts back up. And we were able to really help kids and staff and family out. So that was it on my end. So oh, good, Kevin, thank you. And, and tell this teacher that we are all just in awe of her, for a first year teacher especially, amazing. I think we have just a couple final announcements um, since it is uh, just about, our hour's about up. Um, the first one is um, that we are going to be doing nominations um, from August 15th to September 15th, all of your agency directors will get notified. But this is a really good time for you to just check in with them. Um, we have the, the form on the captain website um, for your end of year check-in um, with your agency directors. It'd be a great time to check in just to let them know what you have been doing. Um, and yeah. yeah, I was going to say each group has their own check-in meeting guidance document that will guide you. So each of our family support regional center and the schools have developed a way to have the conversation with your agency director or your SELPA director. And those are in the cadre resource section on um, the, cap the captain website. <clears throat> Let them know that you're still interested in taking part next year and that we will be having our summit in November in person. So we look forward to uh, seeing you all there. Uh, great job this year, you guys. I mean, truly some of the most inspirational and amazing stories um, have come from all of you and the work that you've been doing with teachers and families um, and community providers out there. Um, we hope you all have a really restful summer um, and that by the time school starts back up again and we reconnect again next year, the world will be open. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. And let's give our presenters uh, a clapping uh, for Jamie and Joan and Cassandra and uh, Kevin and Jessica, who couldn't be here. Uh, but thank you. You guys were amazing. As we said, the PowerPoint for this presentation and the recording is on the Padlet, the English Padlet under Preparation Strategies for Educators. And so we'll put that recording up as soon as it gets edited and posted. So good to see all of you. Bye. Take care. See you in next year.